very good uh, afternoon distinguished uh, participants ladies and gentlemen uh, i think we can uh, start this session uh, which is about uh, how circular economy can contribute to rural development i think all of us know that you know cities they occupy only 2% of the earth's land area but they are responsible for 70% of the consumption of all resources they are also responsible for 80% of the global gdp 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions and um, also um, they will be occupying uh, the, the, there will be more than 75 70% uh, people living in the urban areas so what is happening with regard to the the rural areas does it mean that there is some gray areas in the rural areas and how this circular economy can bridge the number of gaps in rural areas including including the rural empowerment rural economic upliftment poverty eradication and all these things that have strong implications with regard to mdg sorry sdgs sdg1 uh, poverty eradication sdg2 zero hunger and number of other sdgs circular economy should be restorative and regenerative i just i was i was uh, hearing from our keynote speaker in the <laughs> break time but what does it mean with regard to the rural development when it comes to circular economy in the context of rural development there are a number of broad areas that immediately comes into the mind natural resource endowment of the rural areas the social capital the rural urban linkages or the dynamics the market links connectivity food production supply distribution system and a number of economic activity sectors when it comes to rural areas agriculture forestry fishery aquaculture we talk also about bioeconomy and also uh, renewable energy so in that regard so this session will be trying to explore how we can promote the circular economy first of all what circular economy means in rural areas what implication it would have and how can we promote circular economy in rural areas and what are the means of promoting the rural areas who is who will be actually financing who will be actually where the money will come from to create entrepreneurship uh, environment in the rural areas leading to circular economy so there are a lot of questions that we will debate so to start with uh, this session uh, we are very honored to have uh, two uh, uh, distinguished personalities here in this room to uh, to deliver to keynote speaker uh, dr look uh nakaja i hope i spelled your name correctly and dr ashok khosla and i would like to first invite look nakaja who is ex executive secretary of uh, unccd all of you know him and he is now president of a think tank called governance and policies for sustainable development in ben so dr please this is your isn't it yes this is mine Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, fasten your steel belt. We will take off to the rural area and see how uh, the circular economy will work best in that area. I will point out one fact and elaborate on two key messages. The fact is that degraded land are humanity's largest stock of waste, but it is still overlooked and you barely see it in the, in the discourse of circular economy. And then my key messages are the following. Success in bringing our degraded landscape into the loop of the circular economy will be key to leapfrogging sub-Saharan African countries into more sustainable development pathway because Africa, especially sub sahara is largely land-based economy, and second, we must make sure that circular economy is also, and you can put also in capital, regenerative and restorative. If we don't do that, we are not yet circular. 
So those are the points I want to make. Now, let us start by maybe pointing out to the fact that what do we call land degradation? And how do we get there? I may go a bit fast, but I count on you to still follow me. Uh, you know, we call a land, or a landscape, I prefer to say, degraded when it is losing productivity, socioeconomic productivity mainly. And you can see how it happens. You see, when you take a forest or you take a grassland, and you take one of the functions and you use it to the expense of the other functions, and you end up here, degraded, degraded. And uh, fortunately, early this year, IPBS has released uh, his, its um, land degradation and restoration assessment. And if you have not yet read it, I really encourage you to, to, to peruse that report. It says that one third, one third of the world's soil is degraded. One third. And it's still not yet in the circular economy discourse, but one third of the planet is degraded. And 24 billion tons of topsoil is lost every year, mostly due to erosion, and it is impacting 3.2 billion people, costing 10% of the annual gross product of the planet. Something that is of that magnitude, unless we want to still keep on having a brand ad on it, we are not yet secular. So land degradation is really per pervasive. You, you see it everywhere, in all type of land, in all ecosystem, in all countries. It's not just about one region. Another point is that we are still, today, degrading up to 10 million of hectares per year. It is the size of my country. It's as if you take Benin out of business every year. And Benin is about 11 million people. That's the magnitude of the issue uh, I, I want us to really have a close look at. Now, my good friend Ashok here has led uh, the, the, the IRP, you know, uh, the panel on, uh, uh, on land assessment for 2050. And one of the conclusions for 2030 is compared to 2000, we will need some, let's say, average of 500 million hectares of land. Where, and we are all already halfway. Where have we been taking those land? Where? <laughs> Obviously, we have been taking them on our natural and pristine ecosystem. And therefore, we are getting more and more unsustainable and even more vulnerable to the climatic shocks. That's the reality. Now, let us look at what it means, what it implies in Africa. You see, in Africa, land degradation is corroding the pillars of sustainability. You can see it. It is causing extreme poverty in the rural areas, food insecurity and hunger. The irony here is that the very people who are feeding the cities in Africa are those who, when drought comes, are more entrenched into poverty and into food insecurity and into hunger. Those same people are the ones that are de facto custodian of the soil biodiversity. We can't let this continue. And of course, when it happens, it makes them and the whole nation more water stressed and vulnerable to drought, and not, not to mention less, uh, loss of resilience to climate change, loss of biodiversity. And when you talk about forestry, it has taken the whole intergovernmental processes, especially under climate change, to understand that deforestation is caused by 80% by the extension of agricultural land, which is driven by the degradation of agricultural land. So, and in Africa, it means conflict on degraded and scarce or scarce resources and therefore crisis and environmental induced migration. Those are the impact of land degradation and it is up to 11% of the GDP. In my country is 8% of GDP. When you factor all the socioeconomic 
cost of land degradation. Those are the things that we need to take to you know, all the stakeholders and say, let us take this out of the cost of our progress, and then we will really mean progress and development when we talk about growth. I like this. This is, you will see it in the uh, report of IPBS, the relevance of land degradation and therefore the solution to it, which is avoiding land degradation and restoring degraded land to the SDG target. The conclusion is just striking. Avoiding, reducing, and reversing land degradation is essential for reaching the majority of the SDGs and will deliver co-benefit for nearly all of them. So in some countries, that is the entry point, actually, when you talk about secularity, and that's the case in Africa. Now, let us have a closer look to food waste. You can see what food waste implies in different regions of the world. The average is that one third of the food produced is lost from the field to the market, another third is lost from the plate to the bin. And, and in 2011 terms, food waste, if food waste was a country, it will be the third global greenhouse gases emitter just behind China and the US. Now, when you look at those elements, then you can also see how much we can take if we really come up with solutions to those issues. That's what I would like us to look at now. Degraded land are not marginal land. They are not to be forsaken or to be abandoned. Some of them, if not many of them, still hold potential for restoration. And we have to capitalize on that. I call degraded land underperforming asset. And if there's any banker in the room, I know some of them we, we are here. I know one of them will be in the panel. So please ask him, what is he doing to make sure that we really capitalize on the potential for restoration of degraded land? It has been said that we have two billion hectares of land that still hold potential for restoration. Actually, it is a quite conservative assessment because in some places, for instance here, in Niger, in two decades, they have restored five million hectares of land in those areas, and it is not yet here, accounted for as potential for restoration. So you can see that the two billion are quite conservative. That's why, well, with some friends here, I can see uh, some good friends and like minded there. We, we fought the battle to have what is being called now Target 13, uh, 15, sorry, 1503 of the SDGs, which is called land degradation neutrality. It means that, it means a state whereby the amount and quality of land resources necessary to support ecosystem functions and services and enhance food security remain stable or increases within specified temporal and spatial scales and ecosystem. To put it simple, as for the target, it means that from 2015, 2030, we must make sure that we avoid degradation, we reduce processes, and we restore at least as much as we will have degraded. And yes, I'm pleased to report to you that as for uh, last June, 118 countries have made specific commitment to restore and how much they will restore by 2030 and what they will do and how much it will bring to, to the society, to the nation as GDP growth and poverty reduction is part of their national plan. So land degradation neutrality has provided for a new narrative about land a new narrative about restoration, a new narrative about, about rege regeneration, and it is key. What does it mean to go, in, to go land degradation neutral? It means, as I said, to avoid degradation. That's the most cost-effective way. Sustainably managing land landscape, avoiding degradation, reducing or mitigating uh, pro uh, processes of degradation where it is happening, and where we still have potential to restore, 
make sure that we do restore. It calls for, let's say, six key action points. Mapping land status and soil quality and potential. Having clear socioeconomic assessment that speaks to stakeholders and businesses and, of course, uh, within the landscape as well. Managing towards uh, all integrated processes at country level, at state level, and the coordination that it calls for at, at policy level, but also phasing out adverse or perverse incentives and ensuring that we have the positive one that will incentivize reducing, avoiding, and restoring. And of course, bringing all this to make sense at the landscape level. Now, let us come to what it should imply for the circular economy. I like this figure. It's, it's quite simple. We must move from linear to circular. But I stand here to say it is not enough. It is not enough. I call for this, that we must move towards a circular economy that also restore and regenerate, restore the ecosystem services and, the, and regenerate ecosystem functions. So that's what I hope we will take here, from here as a takeaway. Not this one is not enough, but that one. It means circular economy must reach out to our degraded ecosystem, that's what's here, and bring them to use and then into the virtuous cycle of circular economy. And what does it mean for Africa? You see, this landscape was the landscape in Niger. I show you where it is, and that was in 1990. And it has been turned into this. It means it's feasible. And this has been done by smallholder farmers. And scholars, literally, they, they, they label the process farmer managed natural regeneration, understanding that to regenerate, it's also about learning how nature can do it, and we really manage nature-based processes. It is faster than coming and just planting trees, at least in those contexts. So in Africa, you see, this is the map of uh, biomass productivity decline, and you look at the potential for restoration. You, it's almost overlapped. You can know that where degradation has taken place, there's wealth there. It's just about what we do to bring that wealth to work for people. In Africa, when you map poverty, hunger, and vulnerability to climate or climatic shocks, they overlap in the rural areas. So investing there, investing on the poor 